In this episode, we are going to be reviewing Billy Budd from 1962. This was directed by Peter Ustinov, and it also starred Peter Ustinov, as well as Robert Ryan, Terrence Stamp, and Melvin Douglas. I'm also going to be talking to J.R. Jones, who wrote a bio biography on the actor, one of the leads in this film, Robert Ryan, which is called The Lives of Robert Ryan. Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast where we explore movies from all over the world and talk about how those stories were told on film, as well as uh, interviews with various industry professionals, writers who in film, television, and theater, and so on and so forth. And a very special guest today, I want to welcome J.R. Jones, who wrote a book on one of the stars of this film, Robert Ryan, called The Lives of Robert Ryan. But J Jim is also a longtime journalist, Chicago journalist, who from 2008 to 2018 served as film editor and lead critic for the Chicago Reader. He is a member of the National Society of Film Critics, and his writing has been honored by the Chicago Headline Club and the Association of Alternative News Media. Among many other publications, his work has appeared in Chicago Magazine, the Chicago Sun-Times, Kenyan Review, Noir City, and the anthologies, the Capel Music Writing 2000, and for kids of all ages, the National Society of Film Critics on Children's Movies. So Jim, welcome. Thanks again for doing this. Thank you so much. I'm flattered by your interest in my seven-year-old book. Oh, my, my pleasure. I mean, it's such a great book um, that I had heard about it over the years. And then when I when I got in touch with uh, Cheney, who's been on my show a couple of times, Robert Ryan's son, uh, I read the book initially to, to talk to him, but I always, I always wanted to, I wanted to get to it because I, I just love Robert Ryan so much. And it's such a fantastic book about this really remarkable man. I, I'm just curious going, going back when, do, do you remember the first film you saw with, with, uh, with Ryan? Um, yeah, it was actually the film we're going to talk about today. Billy. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I was, uh, I went to high school at a Jesuit uh, uh, college prep school called Loyola Academy, which is in Wilmette, Illinois, um, north of Chicago. And uh, uh, it was an all boys school then, now it's co-ed. But um, at that time, it was all young men. And, um, you know, we studied uh, religion all four years since it was a Catholic school. And the first year of my religious instruction, uh, in fact, the first semester I think we uh, watched the film Billy Budd and discussed this at great length because it's a Christian allegory of course and um, so I became aware of Ryan you know at a very young age I'm sure much younger than most of my peers because he was sort of out of the public eye at that time he had died a few years earlier and his movies weren't really you know in circulation so much so he had already been sort of it was already sort of receding in the public memory and so I think the fact that I saw that movie and he made such an impression on me in that movie um, probably has a lot to do with the fact that I wound up writing this book uh, just because he was in my consciousness much much earlier than he probably would have been otherwise. I mean, I'm sure I would have found out about him eventually, but it probably would have been, you know, when I was in college or, or in my 20s when I was going to revival houses all the time. Um, so that was the first one I saw and um, it's it's a hell of a performance and he plays you know, for someone who didn't like to play the heavy, he plays a completely malevolent, you know, really wicked character and, yeah. uh, and uh, does it with great relish. And, uh, and, and it's a pretty well shaded performance. So um, yeah, that was the first thing I saw. And I remember um, after seeing the movie in class, I remember walking, uh, there was a hallway in the school where they had all the class portraits and I, you could walk down the hall and uh, he had actually graduated from uh, Loyal Academy. I guess I forgot to mention that. And so he was in the class of 1927. So I saw his photograph there in the hallway and uh, he looked like this nice Irish boy, you know, not really meant for a career of wickedness and malevolence. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was the first film as I saw. Did you, did you then try to like, you know, obviously now, you know, we're so fortunate with streaming services, we can get these, movies at the click of a button but did you actively try to seek out more of his films then or was that something you just started to look at later on not really I mean I, I I knew who he was and that and that film made a big impression on me I don't think I really 
I'm trying to remember when I started uh, really figuring out who he was. It probably wasn't until I was in my 30s and, and uh, had access to Turner Classic Movies. Mm. It was um, much better going to a revival house, much better than going to a revival house because it's 24 seven and uh, you know, and they have the RKO library. So they show all of that stuff over and over and over again. Um, and I think that's probably when I became more exposed to his films. And I had thought about him for a long time as a possible subject for a book. Uh, but I, you know, it wasn't until much later that I, that I actually embarked on it. So, but I, I think I became more aware of him in my, my thirties and, and maybe early forties. You said, you said something uh, interesting uh, because I know from uh, where you work that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you found uh, that it was, it was either a letter or a document that he wrote for his child to, to his children about, you know, his life and, and career. Um, and what was that really what got you interested in, in writing the book? Like what, what was it about him that, that sort of struck you as worth writing about? Well, it was certainly that document. Um, the background of that is I, I, I worked from about 1997 until uh, uh, 2018 at the Chicago Reader as an editor and then later as the film critic. And um, at one point I got this email at work from Michael Miner, who was uh, the media columnist there, um, asking if anybody knew who Robert Ryan was. And, you know, it was one of those email threads. One or two people said, oh, yeah, you know, he was in the Wild Bunch or something like that. But nobody, nobody knew who he was. Of course, I was I knew exactly who he was. And I was in Miner's office about 60 seconds later, wanting to know what this was all about. He had this manuscript that had been given to him at a party by a friend uh, in Evanston or at a dinner party uh, that had been given to this person in turn by Lisa Ryan, who had found it among her father's papers. And I think the idea was that the reader was going to publish this thing um, mainly as a as a it's so evocative of Chicago in the teens uh in the early 20s I think they wanted to publish it just as an online piece um just as a memoir of the city at that time um I don't think they really ha had any uh clear sense of who Ryan was or what his importance was in the cinema um and so but once I got a hold of this thing I, you know I asked I asked Mike if I could you know write about it and he said yeah sure um and um I started researching the family's life in the city uh, during that time. And I found out um, that Ryan's father, I found out, found out this story about Ryan's father who had been a, uh, an executive uh, for a construction company that he and his brothers owned in the city, a very well, politically well-connected construction company. Uh, they built, did a lot of uh, city work and built sewer tunnels in the city. And um, there was all of this uh, uh, journalism from uh, 19, 32, I think is when it happened about this huge tunnel fire that happened um, in one of their projects in the Pilsen neighborhood um, in which 12, 12 uh, people were killed and another 50 people were injured. It was a huge, huge disaster at the time. Um, and then once my editors found out about that, they got very excited about the story. Suddenly, you know, it, it you know, had a, a sort of like central thing. I, I imagine they were more interested in that again than Ryan. Um, <laughs> so anyway, the story kind of took off and, uh, and wound up being published in October uh, 2009, which was uh, the centennial of Brian's birth. I think it was a week or two shy of the centennial of his birth. And, um, and I interviewed all three of his children for the story briefly, um, and uh, so made contact with them. And I think when they saw the story, I think they liked it a lot because they didn't really know any of the stuff that happened. Um, and it was a surprise to them. This is something that had been not, not necessarily concealed in the family, but hadn't been talked about at any length. And uh, so I think the fact that they learned something about their father, who was in some ways kind of a mysterious figure to them, uh, probably gave me more of an entree than I would have had if I had just shown up at their door and, you know, asked to write a book about their family. Right, right. And and was the document that he left behind, was it was it quite lengthy or was it? Uh... It was about 19 pages. Oh, like, so it was pretty short. Okay. Space. Yeah, it was just a, it was just like it was one of those things, you know, you look at things that he had written. There aren't a lot of um, there aren't a lot of manuscripts around that he wrote, but he would just sort of start writing about something. And like a lot of amateur writers would just sort of drift into another subject and, you know, it sort of would kind of meander to an end, you know, where, at the point where he ran out of stuff to talk about. Um, but it was only about, yeah, only about 19 pages in length. But we wound up 
publishing the whole thing online and people can find that at the uh, chicagoreader.com. It's still up there if anyone's interested to look at it. Oh, wow. Okay, great. I'll have to check that out. Do you know when he when he wrote that? Was that towards the end of his life or is it not uh, documented? Uh, probably closer to the end of his life than the beginning, I guess, but there was nothing, nobody, none of the children knew it wasn't dated. And, um, I could, there was nothing in the document that I could really figure out to date it. I mean, it could have been anywhere from the fifties to the end of his life. I really, really don't know. I suspect hmm. it was very late in his life, but I, I, that's just my own intuition, not based right. on it that's on the manuscript. What what was what was it like to talk to Cheney and Lisa and his his other son? I mean, was it was it uh, challenging to get them to? Oh, because as as you know, Cheney's even said like he was he was mysterious. He was hard to read. Mm -hmm. Was it was it hard to get um, a lot of you know personal details and stories? Or how did, how did that go? Well, um, no, they were all very candid um, and and. Uh, and none of them asked to look at the manuscript, uh, which is good because I wouldn't have shown it to them. And um, they were they were great. They they were as candid as they could be about themselves. I think when it came to their parents' lives, I think because their parents were very private people, I think they um, were more concerned about their parents' privacy than their own. Does mm. that make sense? Yeah, I, that's what I was wondering about because like that's what Cheney was saying. They were so private, so. I wondered how it was to get them to talk about these, you know, stories. Well, there was, you know, there was apparently there was correspondence between the spouses, which I really wanted to see, but you know, that I did, they weren't going to let me look at that. So, um, but I, I think they were pretty candid. I mean, the thing is their parents both died when they were all very young. I mean, none mm. of them college. Well, I guess Cheney was out of college, but I mean, they were just only a year or two out of college when their parents died. So, um, uh, well, I'll take that back. Cheney was actually was, in the midst of college but in any case they were in their yeah, he was about 25 26 so um, he was fairly maybe. young uh let's see he would have been 25 right um but uh you know so i think they've all had a lot of time to think about they never knew their parents in adulthood so they've only had time to think about them in adulthood and uh you know and and um so they're viewing them when i spoke to them they were viewing their parents you know from a lens of you know many many decades so but uh you know they were great to work with um and uh you know there were some things they weren't going to talk about but i mean i would think there were things that i wouldn't want to talk about were my family you know so um and i think they um i mean there are all three of them i think really interesting people and all fairly different from each other um i think i learned more probably from getting to know them personally I think I probably learned more about their parents from getting to know them personally than they necessarily told me. I don't know if that makes sense, but, and it's not really fair to like view them as like a composite of their parents, but I mean, you know, they, they were raised by these people and they did, you know, in many ways embrace their values. And so I think I, just by getting to know them, that helped me figure out a lot of things about the parents. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know you mean, because obviously they, they brought them up. So you'd see perhaps certain behavior from them that you, you'd imagine would come from how they were brought up as, you know, they're as like Cheney's very political and politically minded. I mean, he certainly got that from his, from his parents. And he told, he told me he did for sure. Well, I think that was meeting him was definitely interesting because that in a way gave of, of because of his work and um, conflict resolution, that's in a way helped me kind of find an angle on the book aside from it being a movie book because Ryan was a peacenik, you know, basically, and, and put so much time into anti-nuclear work and yeah. protesting the Vietnam War. And, and uh, you know, and he was in the United World Federalists. I mean, all of these things. And, um, and so that was kind of a way, uh, in a literary, literary way, I guess, of shaping the book. So I tried to, I tried to kind of approach ideas of, of, you know, personal responsibility in, in wartime and, um, and also personal responsibility in terms of politics and people's participation in the, in uh, domestic politics. You know, it's interesting because as it, it, it must've been a challenge, uh, as you were just saying, you know, as a writer, when people, uh, and I know in another interview, you mentioned that 
people would say, oh, yeah, I, I loved him, but I didn't know him at all, <laughs> you know, and his kids said, you know, he was hard to read. So how, how did you because for me, I, I, I feel like I, I get to know the man, even though people told you that. So how did you go about sort of trying to capture him? Was was it sort of just looking at the things that he was doing, what he was involved in and uh, just, you know, obviously what you do is who you are in a lot of ways. I mean, how, how did you, uh, how did you go about trying to nail that down? I think the main way that I did that was by trying to find anything, um, trying to find anything he'd ever said or written. Um, uh, right. Was the primary thing. I mean, I spent an enormous amount of time going through archives and running down newspaper stories and all of this stuff. And I, I thought this is the only way I'm going to penetrate this guy is by just collecting what he said and uh, there isn't a lot I mean some of his personal correspondence is in other people's collections like there are letters he wrote to Jean Renoir and people like that that are in their collections but his own papers were never collected at the time of his death uh, or anything like that so um, there isn't a lot to work with um, like I said I did a ton of um, research in, in terms of looking up old stories you have to be careful about that stuff because a lot of movie journalism from the you know 30s and 40s is just made up anyway i mean it's right. never viable so i mean i tried to be uh, i tried to be as strict as i could in evaluating stuff like that but it was interesting because you would read this stuff and even though it was you, you could read something that was clearly like a piece of like um you know pr stuff there would be some quote in it from him that would be so weird that I would think, well, there's no way some publicist thought of this. So it must be relatively close to what he actually said or thought because you know his, his point of view was a little bit eccentric and it wasn't something that some publicist would you know, make up some quote, you know, put it into his mouth. So, I mean, I tried, to be, uh, I tried to be cognizant of that, but I also tried to collect as many of his words as I could. What, 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 for, what, for example, popped out to you that you felt that he must have said that that must have not been something that some publicist made up? Things that he would say about acting. Um, you know, I found this, these old uh, materials, um, you know, in a, uh, from an archive that were, um, they were like unpublished stories that he had, or unpublished um, stories written by some guy in New York who had interviewed him about, um, acting and had quotes from that. And then there were also things that were sort of like, uh, had no author, um, but uh, you know, he would have some remark in there about how he approached a character or how he approached a story. And it was clear like, that that was something that had come out of him and not had been put into his mouth. What, were you nervous about how, how his children would respond to the book? I mean, how, how did they respond in general? They liked it pretty well. Um, yeah. You know, Cheney speaks highly of it. Well, I was very pleased by that. Um, uh, you know, I I can't imagine what it would be like to read something like that because it's so reductive of what your own experiences is. I mean, how could it not be? Right. Um, but I was grateful that I did get a chance to interview him and Lisa at such length because there was a lot of stuff about the family in there. And um, the one thing people, everybody understood about him that was that uh, even though he might have been distant around the house. His children and his family were a huge priority in his life. Um, and he sort of ordered everything in his life was ordered around um, his family as much, right. as, as much as it could be, um, as much as it could be in him still pursue the career he was in. You get the feeling that he re clearly really cared about his family and loved his family so much. But as they said, he was perhaps um, on a one to one basis somewhat distant uh, from, from what from what I was reading or what, um, you know, what, what, what uh, Cheney was saying. And, you know, and then it's, it, if you look at his, you know, he was very, you know, politically left wing, but yet he is <laughs> the, con the contrast is he played these parts that were the total opposite. So there's, there's always these sort of um, contra uh, I don't know if it's necessarily a contradiction, but a contrast anyways, uh, and a complexity to that, which is, really what's so fascinating about him person. I mean, by watching his performances, you think he is these guys. Uh, not that they're all necessarily the same. He did a lot of stuff, but you know, he's known for the rougher types, but I, I just find that so 
interesting uh, about him. I wonder if that was sort of the appeal uh, also for you. Uh, well, it was certainly a way to, it was certainly a way to pitch the book, uh, right. you know, because otherwise people's reaction was, well, who is this guy? Nobody's heard of, you know, people didn't remember who he was. Um, and so that, you know, the sort of contrast between the way he was in private life and the kind of characters he played was yeah, the easy hook. I mean, it was the best thing I could come up with for selling the book. I mean, he was a complicated guy, yeah. uh, but that was a good way to present it, I suppose. And, yeah. and really, you know, it, certainly he was good at playing those parts. And I mean, if you look at the, the performance he gives in Billy Budd, I mean, he invests them with so much intelligence, especially when he's playing really wicked characters. He didn't want, he did not play a lot of stupid characters. I mean, right. you like a movie like The Setup, you've probably seen that one. Oh, yes. One of my so, favorites. I mean, not one of, probably not the sharpest knife in the drawer, the character he plays in that movie, but even when he was playing villains, they would be, there was a lot going on. You could tell there was a lot going on in their head and that was usually visible through his eye movements and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So he was able to communicate um, a, a level of gravity that people didn't usually see in a villain, I suppose. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, when you when you look at a lot of these parts, it it makes me wondered about where his taste lied because he often played even the villains uh, were men that were always sort of grappling with themselves. I mean, you really saw that with Billy Budd, the guy who could not look at himself uh, on dangerous ground. You know, as a character who 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 he starts hope he starts to look at himself even the setup to an extent but i know that in the book he had said that you know he, he liked the power of the medium because it uh it, it could show on it can enlighten audiences you know and, and social consciousness films like crossfire um did, did he ever talk about like his sort of taste and stories or or parts i mean because that was one thing that popped out to me after watching billy Budd. he seems to like people who just grapple with themselves um yeah, I mean, he certainly wanted, yeah, that's certainly what he wanted was internal conflict when he was yeah. a character for sure. Um, I think in terms of the kind of writing he liked to do, he he liked, he wanted to do classics. I mean, he wanted to do Shakespeare and he wanted to do, you know, O'Neill and, and he, those were the, some of the most satisfying experiences he had doing Antony and Cleopatra and doing um, Coriolanus off-Broadway. Uh, so that was the that was a sort of material he wanted to play in terms of characters yeah i think he uh you know as i think i wrote in the book he understood when he did crossfire that playing these kind of characters will could actually enhance an actor's reputation right, and serve the story i mean yeah. yeah like he didn't mind playing the villain but like as long as the story was obviously not a pro bigot bigotry it's obviously anti bigotry so that was what was most important well, when he played those roles, I mean, he kind of had to be talked into it each time. Well, Crossfire, he didn't have to be talked into it, but the sort of feedback or the blowback, I suppose, he got from playing those roles made him more reluctant to do that. And also, I think, you know, when he did Bad Day at Black Rock, that was another character where he plays this uh, this character who's, um, you know, who's, who murders this Japanese farmer after after the Pearl Harbor bombing. And um he had, I think the only reason he did that is because he wanted to work with Spencer Tracy and that had a great cast, Spencer Tracy and his Borgnine, Lee Marv and all of these people. Um, and his friend Dory Sherry produced it. So, but, and then I think, and also with Odds Against Tomorrow, the film you talked about with Cheney, I think he really, that was when he really had to be talked into it because by that time he was trying to, uh, you know, his career wasn't going so great and now he probably felt like that was the last thing he needed was to play another part like that. But I think he, he liked Belafonte so much that he did yeah. the film and, and, and was concerned about the issues so much that he did, did the film anyway. Yeah, no, and, and thank God he did. I mean, and, and there, there certainly is uh, more complexities to his character in, in On Dangerous Ground as opposed to Crossfile. I mean, they're never just like the same people. I mean, they have a lot of things in common. But On Dangerous Ground, I thought he, the sorry, not on, uh, not on Dangerous Ground, Odds Against Tomorrow. Um, I mean, he's, he's similar to the character in Crossfile, but they really go more into you know how he was disappointed in his own life and how he felt he couldn't take care of Shelley Winters and his fight you know there was there was a lot more um about him whereas Crossfire was a little more simplistic so um it's uh, uh 
I guess so. I've always, I've never been a huge fan of odds against tomorrow, actually. I mean, I, you know, it has its merits, but to me, it, you know, it's racial politics seem outdated to me. And, and just the fact that it's, I mean, it came so late in the noir cycle. It came so late that it's sort of recycling a lot of itself. And in fact, Robert Wise, who directed it, recycled a lot of things he'd done in other noir films. And it just has this sort of, um, and the actors are much older, of course. Um, to me, it just has this sort of perfunctory feeling to it. Um, although I know Cheney really likes it, and I know other people that, that are quite taken with it. Yeah, I, I re- you know, the first time I saw it, I, I didn't take to it as much. And then when I saw it again, I, I don't know, like, I really, it, it, was, it was more just the complexity of the men. It was sort of just, I, I appreciated that there was this crime film. But really, like, they didn't really get to that till the later part of the film. It was like, why are these men doing this? And what are they about? I thought that was interesting. Right. Well, Ed Begley's in it. I'll watch anything with him. So. <laughs> yeah, he's great. I love him in uh, 12 Angry Men and, and uh, yeah. so many films. Um, yeah, I wanted to touch a little on, on his approach to acting because I, find, I, I really appreciate that you talked about that in the book. Like, he studied with Max Reinhardt at the, in L.A., the Reinhardt School. and you know, obviously, and, and he had mentioned that some of his instructors, you know, had studied with, with Stanislavski in Russia. And I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't part of the sense memory, the method style. Uh, but I like that he, he said that he just was, he just listened, he was taught to just listen and also use movement uh, to define a certain character or something external that would help his performance. And um, what are the characters doing in, in action? And I think he, he brought that into everything he did because he's so present. He's not like performing. He's not over the top. He's not trying. He's not pushing. Um, and as he said, as you quoted him in the book, it was, you know, if you listen, then your, your reaction is going to be much easier. Uh, and I thought, you know, that's, that really is what acting, as an actor myself, that really is what acting is all about. And what's interesting is like the story on Billy Budd is that he didn't, he to create the right tension with stamp Terrence stamp he never talked to him which i thought was an interesting choice because you really didn't see actors doing that until like the 1970s you know robert de niro's walking around you know on set and treating the other actors as the character would or not talking to them all together um i i thought that you know you didn't hear actors doing that really before you know from his generation i don't know if was that something that um stood out to you did he do that more than more than once or was it just on this occasion i don't know if you happen to know i don't really know you know and that that story comes from stamp himself and so one thing you realize is that when you hear these stories from people they're completely colored by their own feelings about the situation and two people can see the same incident and have completely different versions of it Um, that's true you know i i mean and so it's possible that that's just how Stamp reacted to Ryan. I mean, Ryan was not the most, you know, <laughs> you know, he was he was a nice guy and everything and a cordial person and everything and you right. know friendly, but he just was not somebody that was going to like put his arm around you. That's and, possible, yeah. And so that might have just been Stamp's reaction to how, you know, Ryan just was all the time. I'm not I'm not really sure about that. I don't I, I did not find a lot of. I mean, there were certainly situations where he was working with young performers um, who didn't know what they were doing, um, but were trying. And he would always be really good with them. Marilyn Monroe, obviously, is an example from Clash. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and but there were there were a lot of other there were a lot of stories like that where somebody was like new to what they were doing and, and stories about how patient he was and how good he was with the young actors and, and, and things like that. Um, I didn't get a whole lot of there aren't a whole lot of stories that I found about him, you know, doing things like that with Stamp. Yeah. 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 You, that's a good point. I didn't think of it. You know, sometimes you hear these stories and you think, well, that must be the absolute truth, but you're right. There's always a flip side where maybe he, maybe Stamp just took it that way, you know, cause I, 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 I thought that was, uh, that was an interesting story. And uh, I, I, he, he doesn't strike me as someone who would do that, Ryan, like, well, let's do this for the sake of the work. Um, cause as I said, I don't think he was sort of anyone who tried to, you know, ma- make the set, uh, any kind of tension on set. So it was, I just, I wondered if maybe there was other stories of that, but, 
Uh, no, nothing that I know of, or you know of anyways. <laughs> no, nothing like that. I really don't know. It might've just been the age difference. I mean, this guy was like 22 yeah. years old. Ryan was 51 at that point. So, What are, what are some uh, favorites of, of yours of, uh, other than Billy Budd? Oh boy. Well, um, on dangerous ground, that's definitely a key performance for him. I think, um, in terms of like, are you talking about the quality of the film or his performances? Just the, the films in general. Because, because there's often a huge difference. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, as he said, he hated most of his films, right? As opposed, maybe there was like six or seven he liked. Yeah, yeah. Well, a hundred films. He made like, well, I made like 70 odd films. And, you know, and, and I think I wrote about maybe 30 of them. The rest of them were just not worth saying anything at all. <laughs> he worked with Clark Gable, you know. Yeah. Some- that um so i would i would give him more credit than that than having five or six good films um but i think in terms of his oh yeah per- me too one performance that that i that i thought that just blew me away and that has been almost impossible for people to see was in this tv show he did uh but this tv adaptation of the snows of kilimanjaro i wanted to see that when you when i was googling it and i couldn't find it because that sounds you know, really good was- as far as as far as I know, the only way you can see this thing, it was it was broadcast live. It was performed live and um, broadcast on CBS and uh, CBS. Anything that's owned by like uh, network television is almost impossible to get the rights to um, or to get access to it. So it's never been video and it's never been I guess there would never be any demand for it on video since Ryan's not that big a star. But. Um, this was a live TV drama that was performed, I think, in 1961. It was directed by John Frankenheimer, mm. um, uh, one of his, who, you know, got his start in television. And um, it came out a couple of years after the uh, uh, screen adaptation of Snows of Kilimanjaro with C- Gregory Peck, which Hemingway famously hated because they put a happy ending on at the end of, of the story, um, yeah. you know, where the hero gets rescued. Uh and uh, so they had to do this program live. Uh, um, it was supposed to be taped originally, but uh, they found out that the TV show, if they taped it, it would be an co- infringement of the copyright of the film. So suddenly, like a week before the production was supposed to air, they found out they, they were going to have to do the entire thing live. And um, it's a story where this guy in, in the snows of Kilimanjaro, this, the protagonist is... is you know, up in the mountains and he's dying of gangrene and he's delirious and he's remembering all of this stuff. And uh, so to do that in a movie is not that difficult. You just crossfade, you know, from one set set to the other, but doing it live, it was practically impossible. So what they came up with was, was this, this idea of just having this bed on a uh, rotating platform and having a camera on the platform too, pointed at Ryan in the bed. So as he's like, you know, weaving around in bed or whatever, um, the lights go down behind him. They would turn this platform 90 degrees or whatever. The lights would come up again and he'd be in the next scene. He'd just get out, get out of bed and walk into the next scene where he's in, you know, Paris in 1920 or something like that. So, uh, so physically it was a hugely demanding, um, performance and, and just as a, as an actor, I mean, he was on screen almost the entire thing for 90 minutes playing all of these different, uh, moods and playing uh the character at different ages just like that um and um and then it was broadcast and no nobody ever saw it again <laughs> so the only way to see this thing is at the paley center for media in new york and in los angeles you can go into their oh you know, wow viewing room and request the thing and see it um i'd love so to see that that's a favorite performance um i think he's great and um the Iceman cometh although that's kind of a marathon viewing experience uh, it's four hours long <laughs> yeah yeah so directed by frankenheimer and it's uh hugely claustrophobic because they shot the whole thing in indoors on purpose to make it claustrophobic and boy it sure is um but he's wonderful in that um i think the movie caught that max o fools movie where he's playing sort of a fictional version of howard hughes that's a great i still have to see that yeah, I that's still a great to see that. Um, well, that's it, it's 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 a good movie, but it's one of those ones that got kind of chopped up in the post production process. So I don't think Ryan ever had strong feelings for it, um, except dismay. Oh. Uh, but it's a pretty and it's it's a flawed film, but he's great in it. Um, 
let's see. Um, yeah, those would be the major ones. I mean, I, I he's good in so many films, it's hard to sort them out. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, every, everything I see him in, he's he's always uh, really powerful and, and subtle. I mean, I just he just had a face that, you know, like you saw a lot of some of the actors back then, like Lee Marvin as well, even Burt Lang, like Burt Lancaster. They just had this face of like experience. They look like they've seen and they did see stuff You know, <laughs> like he was in the war. And, you know, I know I know in the book you said he worked a lot of hard labor. And I think that, right. you know, but it lent himself to just like so captivating i mean he's just uh he's really really wonderful uh so as i was saying before we started recording is i hadn't seen this before billy bud and i know that you know in the book you had mentioned that this was a great experience for him he really li liked the book and uh cheney told me a, a story that i believe both of you were at a uh ryan robert ryan uh, festival and and he had said in a q a he didn't like it and someone got mad at him at the audience <laughs> <laughs> uh which i thought was funny and um but I remember what so, his complaint is about the film but i can understand why people wouldn't like it i mean it's you know it's it's rather slow paced um and it's kind of a it's kind of a an actor showcase i mean as a cinematic experience it's you know leaves something to be desired but you know that's for me the story uh it's such a it's such a uh, it's a story that it resonates in so many ways especially me since i was we had a christian education uh, that yeah. it uh, has a, a lot of um i don't know it works for me yeah me too because like i said i i loved it i mean it was one of it's from i mean it's one of those films that just absolutely suck you in and stay with you like i just found for the i watched it a few days ago for the rest of the day, I mean, because I, you know, I, I love, I love behavior. I love to see why people do what they do, and I think this film is just full of uh, the behavior and and the whys and the ambiguities as to why these men are are doing what they do. But I, 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 I think, I think part of the reason, perhaps, why people don't like it is because I know in the book there was more homosexual subtext to the characters that. Obviously, they uh, at the time they you know they couldn't explore uh, Ustinov. You know, he as he said, you know, it was already um, a tough sell, particularly with the downbeat ending. So they 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 sort of took a lot of that. I think that was also Cheney's uh, problem with it. Um, mm -hmm. But as, but aside from that, I thought it was a I thought it was a wonderful film, and I'm I'm curious you know, because it's a complicated story. I'm curious what you feel the film, what's the essence of the story to you? Well, I mean, the essence of it is, is I think is the Christian allegory, but I think, I think the reason it's a little bit hard for people to understand the film is just because of the political subtext around it. I mean, it happens like about 20 years after the French were up, well, maybe, 10 or 15 years after the French Revolution and the the revolutionary French Republic is is you know now commanding a naval force on the high seas and so the British of course you know fearing such a revolution they don't want that to spread to, to the UK obviously and they don't want it spreading to their ships either and there had already been major mutinies aboard a couple of English vessels at yes that. so um so the, the people commanding the vessel are extremely leery of, of uh, losing control of the ship. And they have uh, Claggett in there, who's sort of their enforcer. I mean, he's really the one keeping, keeping you know, everything clamped down with these men. Um, and yet he's this completely evil character. And, but of course, is this completely angelic character. And I think the way Melville describes him, uh, or, or he describes, when he's writing about Claggart, he describes him as being just completely malevolent by nature, um, not because of his schooling or how he yeah. was raised or the experiences he had. He was just born evil. And uh, and Bud seems to have been born, you know, sort of an angel. He's this angelic character and is, uh, you know, as is completely humble and uh, everybody loves him. Uh, you know, so he's this this sort of beloved figure who winds up being sacrificed so that they can keep order on the ship at the end of the film i guess i've just blown the end of the movie sorry <laughs> that's all right it is 60 years old after all yeah if you have this a year is 60 years old right yeah so i think that that 
I think that that uh, the spiritual part of the story is what keeps it humming. I think even though it's um, as I said, a, a, a bit of a stodgy film in some ways. Well, I what what fascinated me, and I think it's it's relevant even now. You know, you see the, you know this war in 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 the Ukraine with Russia and Ukraine, and and of course you ask yourself. What, what drives you to do this? You know, what, what would drive you to invade a Putin, to in, invade a country um, and, and kill innocent people? And when you look at, you know, Claggart, you uh, played by Ryan, you ask yourself, I ask myself the same thing. Why do you take pleasure in, in, in creating this environment of fear amongst all these men on this ship uh, because and Ustinov, you know, I love that little speech he gives the men where he says your your job is to follow orders, and that's it, you know. And and uh, he or he says he says something else that goes with that, to obey and follow orders, something along those lines. So it's like they didn't want these people to think; they wanted them to just fight, follow orders, and and that's it. So you know, they're afraid of these these revolts. So they're like, well, let's. Let, let's, you know, the, the, of course, their reaction is to just use more aggression. Um, you know, let's create fear. Let's whip these men. And, you know, as we saw off off the top early on, you know, this one guy's getting whipped. And I, I felt so bad for Billy Budd, who just came off this much more friendlier ship. And he's looking off in the distance. And you know what he's thinking, like, oh, my God, why am I now here? And no one can tell him, you know, hey, why did they do that? Uh, you know, it's just his turn, right? So right. Uh, obviously, they're they're creating this this environment, and I think the film was really asking, like, why why don't we just communicate with one another? Why don't we just love one another? Why don't we just really face each other, face ourselves? And there's really no answer. I mean, you know, Claggart is just trying to bring Billy Bud down to his level. Right. Uh, you know, I love that scene they have where on the boat and he's, and they say the, the, the sea is calm and he goes, yeah, it might be calm on the surface, but underneath they're all monsters and trying to get at each other and the, the survival of the fittest. And, and that really is how Claggart sees the world. And I think the fact that Billy Budd is proving him somewhat wrong about, about that, or, or not necessarily wrong, but that there's, there's an other option that maybe the world can be better you know, it's like anything else in life. People hang on to their views sometimes in stubborn fashion. Um, and so, and even Ustinov, you know, when they condemn him to death for killing uh, Claggart, uh, he's, he's like, come on, get mad, show your humanity. And he's just shocked. He's shocked that this guy just, even at the end, he's like, he says, God bless uh, the captain right before they hang him. And I thought, again, Ustinov, just that look on his face, like he looked like he was just going to jump off that boat. I mean, he was so moved. Uh, right. but, but, you know, they hated what they had to do to this guy. So I, I, I just, you know, I kept thinking, you know, what is the answer to these questions? And I, I really, I really don't know. I don't know if you, if you felt that the film was kind of, kind of asking those similar questions about the nature of people and the whys behind, you know, this sort of aggression. I, I don't know what you thought. Well, I think in Claggart's case, it's definitely, and I think Ryan communicates this in the performance. It's definitely, there's an element of fear. Yes. That scene that you mentioned where Ustinov comes in, it's a scene where the men are, I think it's after the fellow has died from falling from the mast. Yes. Uh, and and, and uh, Claggart is trying to impose some sort of order and the men are just like, forget it. He's, and he's really losing control. And you can kind of hear the panic rising in his voice as he keeps issuing these commands and he realizes they're, they're not gonna listen to me anymore. And then Ustinov comes in uh, into the middle of this really fraught situation and gives this little speech and he is at a much lower volume level than Claggart. And um, the authority he brings is not the, the authority of the whip, it's the authority of his intellect and his bearing and his, uh, you know, his, uh, his sensitivity in a way. The fact that he understands they've got a terrible deal um, that they've been impressed into the Queen's service, but that's the you know that's the deal they've all been handed, and that's 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 what they have to that's what they have to work with. Um, but I think I think Ryan was able to find 
the vulnerability in the character in that scene and also in that one you mentioned where he's he's keeping watch uh you know and the moon is out and comes up and tries to kind of approach him personally and Claggart sort of, sort of starts to lower his guard and starts reminiscing about his old seafaring adventures and then suddenly he just comes to his senses and says yeah charm me too you're not going to charm me and then and just says get away and so you know it's it's like he cannot stand to and then there's this also uh, the scene where one of the other characters i can't remember which sailor it is runs after him and touches him sh his shoulder and he just whips around and says don't you ever touch yeah. me. there's yeah. such there's so much uh in that uh delivery of that line that uh tells you about him um that he just does not will not be touched by anybody um yes and i think that's the fear talking so but he's an interesting character because as, as um you know, as I mentioned in the book, he's, you know, in, in Melville, he's sort of, nobody really knows where Clagger came from. You know, they suspect he might have been, uh, you know, have gotten his his job, you know, as for commission of a crime or something like that, or that he may have, you know, used, enlisted in the Navy to avoid being prosecuted for some crime or something like that. So um, nobody really knows where he's come from, and he's just sort of, you know, malevolent character anyway so he's he's just sort of this kind of a satanic figure in the film i don't know but i mean ryan tries to humanize humanize him as much as possible i think well yeah you, that, that's a good point and even that scene on the boat and i thought robert ryan just he really found the vulnerability of this man particularly when this man particularly when billy budd says i think you hate yourself and you're lonely and then he just cracks you just see him the, the mask begins to fall a bit and I, I literally thought, oh, OK, maybe this guy's going to change. And then before you know it, as you said, because he's a man of control, he controls every single movement. And like you said, just a touch of the arm uh, set him off. And right away, it's like, get out of here. You know, you're not going to you're, you're not going to charm me. And something you, you mentioned, which is, you know, now dawning on me is, you know, as you said, there's there's always sort of an intelligence to his villains. And it's true. Like he was perceptive. Like he did see that Billy Budd, people were liking him, that he was smart, that he was honest, um, that he was trustworthy. And, and Billy Budd, they both kind of have that in common because Billy also sees him for who he is. He's like, no, I'm not afraid of you. You're not, you're not really who you, you know, no one can take pleasure in in hitting people, you, you, you're just lonely. You're just, <laughs> and uh, which, which of course goes to the Christ-like figure of the guy who just is totally good and, and optimistic and kind and tries to see the good of people. And of course, everyone, you know, well, particularly not, not everyone claggered is trying to just kill him for uh, changing his ways, which is, of course, really interesting. of course, he is all of those things, but he's also the only murderer in the film. Um, that's and, yes, that's good. That's true. And, and there's that moment. I mean, in the same way that Bud has been trying to reach Claggart, Claggart has been trying to corrupt Bud all along. And there's this moment, uh, yes. and it's the weirdest death scene I think I've ever seen, where where Billy finally does strike, you know, hits Claggart, and Claggart falls down, you know, and hit, bangs his head on something, and it's and uh, you know dies. And right before he dies, he he looks, he's looking at Bud and he just gives him the smile. Smile, yeah. And it's lights out. And uh, that's a really weird moment. Um, yeah. He has corrupted Billy Bud because Billy's just killed him. Uh, yeah, which is ultimately what he wanted to do, right? It's, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he, he just had to uh, sacrifice his own life to do it. So it's, it's, it's a really, there are a lot of moments like that in the film that are really hard to uh, parse out. Oh, that's what I was going to mention was the uh, uh, stutter. You know, he's this guy who has this stutter and, you know, but he says that it's because he can't quite find the right words, uh, but yet he always usually does. Like it's, be it's it, you know, particularly when the guy falls and he and uh, Claggart says, oh, no, he, he didn't say he was sick. And then right away, uh, Billy Butt's like, no, yeah, he did. What do you <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, you can't tell a lie. I mean, yeah, he cannot he tell a lie. Um, and he always speaks the truth, and that's what makes him such a troublesome character on board. Um, yeah. Yeah, they just seem to be on a collision course all during the film. 
Yeah, yeah, and and of because I was wondering, well, you know, what what was it about this stutter? Because obviously that it, it seemed like he he stuttered when he when he felt an emotion that he he couldn't kind of overcome. Like early in the film, when he first encounters um, Claggard, he stutters a bit, and I I thought perhaps out of out of fear of him, like he was at first maybe a little afraid before he started to empathize with him. Um, and then, of course, later on, we see in, at the end, I mean, it, it wasn't so much that he couldn't tell the truth. It was whenever he felt that he was either being wronged or he saw something that perhaps uh, made him sick. Um, you know, this, you know, he was accusing him of all, all kinds of lies and it just it just came out in total anger. I mean, did, do you think that was the purpose of the stutter? I was curious what you thought. Well, um, it's the device that I'll, that it's certainly something that they take up at his tribunal after at his court martial afterwards when he's being tried the fact that bud couldn't speak and he spoke oh, yeah he yeah that to me is a fairly flimsy argument i suppose that yeah, is he's like oh yes he, he's a cripple that must <laughs> yeah, self-defense yeah. you know that the everything that happens I, I think after claggart dies the movie probably takes a slight dip after that i mean it becomes very um very much involved in its own ethical debate um and and that scene and they seem to go in such they seem to tie themselves in such knots trying to acquit bud um and captain beer keeps reminding them this is all very simple he killed a man he has to hang yeah and they keep trying to find some way to because the the emotional truth of it is so clear to all of them um that the the legal outcome is something they can't uh they can't stand to do um so yeah i don't know maybe that's why cheney doesn't like it i mean the reasoning of the movie can be a little bit bizarre i mean at one point they're talking about how claggart was the malevolent one and yet bud you know took claggart's sins upon himself by killing claggart i mean you know there's a lot of like sort of like kind of circular logic in in what they're saying um and i think that the once once the ethical part of the movie kicks in, it becomes a little more obvious. I think it's a lot more powerful up to that point. Or maybe that's just another, another way of saying that once once Ryan's out of the picture, it isn't that much fun to watch. <laughs> well, it, you know, I, I, you know, it's interesting because I, I, when he died, I thought, oh, wow, there's still another like, you know, I think half an hour, or maybe more of the film. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I actually found I was still very very involved emotionally I, I actually really liked that scene where they had to discuss what do, you know you see that their own biases and like and and they're both they're they're wrong and they're right I mean you you can you can I mean I don't I don't really I know back then they you know if you killed someone they put you to death that was the law but but there was no sort of I know one of the men say well maybe we can kind of soften the consequence and he's like no you can't um and what's interesting is that they're, they're, they're both wrong and they're right. I mean, because he was so provoked, uh, the guy was trying to ruin him. But, but at the same, you know, maybe there should have been some kind of softening or maybe some kind of consequence where he wouldn't have been put to death. But, you know, the law is the law. You kill someone, you die. I mean, uh, Ustinov was and, right. And yet, and, yet, and yet a lot of the, a lot of the debate in that scene doesn't necessarily turn on the rightness or wrongness of it. It's, it's on how are they going to maintain order? Aboard yes, because they're worried about how the men this, are going to aboard this aboard this ship tending toward mutiny. Um, you know, if we give this guy a pass and say, well, you know, it's OK if, you, if you're a good guy, you can kill someone if you want. I mean, they're yes. worried about losing control of the ship still. So their their actions are still governed by fear, which none of them, I suppose, want to admit. Right. But they are concerned for keeping control of the ship. And that's the bottom line, I think. Um, and the fact that that's presented you know, they paint that in very, you know, they sort of elevate that morally in their own ways, you know, the different men on the tribunal, but when it comes down to it, what they have to do is, uh, is to the, do the same thing as Claggart. They have to maintain order. Yeah. Yeah. You, and, and, you know, it occurred to me that even Billy Budd, when he's about to hang, all the men are looking at him and he, he likely could have easily been like, come on guys, let's, let's just attack everyone. And he doesn't. Uh, and of course, that goes to the to the to the Christ, the, the allegory of this man who 
was so good that even he said, God bless, you know, because as he says to the captain, no, you're just doing your duty. Right. And he's, <laughs> you know, Usadov is just shocked by this guy. That's why I just thought that these, these people's, these view of how they see the world is, was sort of tested and um, perhaps they were going to have to think about life in, in some other way than, than they do. But I also kind of appreciated what Melvin, you know, they bring Melvin Douglas in, um, who's like this uh, senior on the the ship, and they ask him, you know, was there anything but between them? And he's very wise to say yes, you know, like uh, Claggard was a man of great pride, and he was envious of Billy Budd, and this is where the friction started. And he's right. And then I I liked what he said at the end. He goes, you know, we're all complicit, and he's right because you know this guy was clearly Claggard was clearly a liar. Uh, with these accusations he clearly was demonic I mean he wanted to to hit that guy with the whip a hundred times I mean you see Ustinov in that scene he's like he's just absolutely shocked that you'd want I mean you'll kill him I mean uh, to whip someone for nothing for some minor cons just because he spoke out against him a hundred times and you know but he says they're all complicit and they're right because you know Ustinov should have they should have done something about this guy, but they didn't because they thought he was good at what he did. And as you said, it was about keeping order. So as long as he's keeping order, you know, which is a mad, which is such a crazy point of view. It's like going to work and saying, well, this guy's abusive to everyone, but he's good at his job, (laughs) but that's all they cared about. You know, you were talking, you were talking about this before and and watching the movie last night. One thing that I was struck by that I, I guess I had kind of forgotten was how long this question goes on where Bud keeps asking people what did this guy do <laughs> he asks like three or four characters you know what what was what was this man's offense that he got this lashing and none of, <laughs> none of them have any idea yeah um, you know it was just it's just strictly to you know let you know that you know you have you have no you know that you're completely under the control of these people and um yeah. And the um, tiniest, they'll whip you for the tiniest things, you know, might just right. be your turn. As Melvin right. Douglas exactly. Said. But, you know, yeah. life can be like that sometimes. So, I mean, there's another level to it as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I liked about it. Cause it's, it's, it's certainly universal in that sense because people often choose fear because of their, they're afraid of what the consequence is. And of course, in this case, everyone is choosing fear the entire film, even right up until the end. That, Except uh, for this, Bud, who's choosing love. He loves everybody. Yes, of course. And of course, he gets hanged. You know, he gets hanged for it, right? So um, it, 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 the, the only thing that I wasn't too sure how I felt about is that they all seem to kind of band together at the end and they they see that friendship and, and even the voiceover Fire. says, well, he didn't die in vain. He died out of... And I just oh. thought, I don't know about... Really? I, I didn't really... <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, like I said, you know, the 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 ethicizing part of the film, which I guess I would say is like the last half hour. I think that's where, where the film becomes a little more, you know, where people maybe peel away from it. Um, Perhaps. Yeah. You know, the dramatic part of the film, or the, the, to me, the most interesting dramatic parts of the film are the ones with, are with Ryan and Billy Budd. So, um, and Houston of. So once, uh, I don't know. Like I said, once once Ryan's out of the picture, I think it definitely loses something. Did you feel they kind of were, were? Did they manage to slip in any of the uh, homosexual subtext? Do you think? I know that there's a there's a scene where they mention, oh, you know, Ryan always smiles at you. They say to Billy Bud, I, like I don't know right. if you felt they kind of got anything in there. Not, not much, not but we're looking for it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, no, I don't think that was anything they were interested in doing. Um, I think it's more, I think in the film, it plays more as just the clagger too is susceptible to Bud's charm because he's such a, such a nice guy. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I, I mean, it, it sounds like the book is more, more in, interesting just from a well, psychological yeah. level. Um, yeah, except that it's, it's pretty much implied in, in the story too. I mean, it's not, it's not overt by any means. It. Was there anything you wanted to mention uh, about the film or Ryan in general that we didn't touch on? Um, just uh, um, not in particular. I mean, I just wanted to um, thank actually Janine Basinger, who was one of the who was the series editor on the book, um, because I was re- remembering that when I was working on the book, she read a draft of it and suggested that uh, 
there needed to be more in there about the acting. I mean, I'd written this book about an actor, and yet there was very, very little about his method. And um, and so I owe her a debt of gratitude because after that I went back and and really applied myself to try and try to find more uh, information about how he approached roles and how he how he approached what he was doing. And since you're an actor, I mean, how, how did that strike you? I mean, was did you feel like there was enough explanation of what he was doing in the book? Absolutely. Was- I I that that was that was one of the most interesting parts because I'm always fascinated by these act, you know, because in America obviously there there wasn't this sort of serious acting training until uh, you know, well, I guess, I guess when the group theater started in the thirties, so, you know, and then it didn't, that didn't really get into film until the forties or even the fifties right. uh, with, you know, I know Martin Scorsese says he calls it like the post Brando pre Brando period, you know, it's post Brando. You started to get a lot more realistic acting. And then before right. them, there's less so, but I'm always interested in those actors before the quote unquote Brando period that were already quite well known before 1951. And how were they so realistic? And and Ryan is certainly one of them. Uh, many of them, uh, you know, you look at Betty Davis or Joan Crawford or uh, Jimmy Stewart and these people, they, 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 they had maybe some formal training or they learned a lot just on the job, which actually every actor does. I mean, some of the stuff about method has been overblown, um, but you know, I, I really appreciated what he said and how, and he put it in, in a real simplistic way that it's like, no, well, you, a, you listen and that will inform your reactions and you, what is the character doing? And you do it. And in terms of movement, how they may move, um, that, that kind of is how you go about creating a part. So I, I like that a lot because it, and if you, like I said, if you watch his films, he's so present. He's never theatrical. He never pushes. And that's hard to do because I teach acting as well. And, and actors right away, they, they because the camera's on them, instinctually, they're like, I got to do something. I got to perform. But if you just put your attention on the other person and listen, that will all be done for you. And when you watch him, I think that's why his performances are so seamless. I don't know how, I don't know how soon he came to sort of master that. I'm sure it took time. Um, he had his his training on I think he he had all of his training on the stage but even though he was one of these guys who always wanted said he wanted to be on the stage and certainly wanted the prestige of doing stage work which was a lot more prestigious than making movies yeah his mind certainly um even though he talked about that all the time he was really a primarily a screen actor and he knew the camera and he knew how to place his body in relation to the camera and he was very cognizant of of all of these things, and he's and uh, so even though he did stage work, he really understood how to how to work small. Um, Absolutely, because it's all in his face. Whereas in theater, it's, oh, it's in right. your face, but it's also in your voice and in your body. And right. I, I know you had mentioned that some of the reviews he got were were mixed, particularly with Shakespeare. Correct me if I'm wrong, but was was the general consensus that he was somewhat flat? I believe it was along those lines. I think, you know, that was really interesting. A lot of that came from John Hausman, who was a good friend of his, of course, and, and, and you know, a gigantic talent. Um, but Hausman wrote, the stuff that Hausman wrote about him was interesting because it was very critical and, and zeroed in on his voice right away. Um, he has, like me, I guess, like sort of a flat Midwestern type of voice. Uh, the timbre of his voice is not very resonant. Um, and maybe works uh, on in movies, but in in a in a large theater, you know, where you're much more conscious of somebody projecting their voice. Um, I see. I see. That was a serious a serious problem Ryan had. Ah, uh, right. He was able to compensate because he was he compensated for that by his intelligence that he brought to the role, and also his physical stature because he was you know six four, a very imposing figure, and and knew how to use his body, you know, as a performer. Um, and was obviously a very pow- physically powerful guy. Um, I think all of those things were things that Hausman felt helped to compensate for his vocal deficiencies. That's interesting. That's yes, I can I can see that because yeah, that that can be like the way people sound sometimes can make a big. Because I do theater as well, and I know like you could be great, but if you cannot be heard, um, yeah. it it doesn't matter how good you are. And there's nothing you can do about that. It's just yeah. the 
that you were given. I mean, it's best just the instrument you got when you were born. So um, there isn't a whole lot. I mean, there are things you can do to, you know, to, to modify it, but it's, it's, it is an instrument. Um, and so exactly, there's really only so much you can do with it. And there's like, you can probably do even less than to that, to that than you can to your appearance. You can probably change your appearance a lot more than you can your voice. Exactly. Exactly. But it seems, it seems as if once he got to like long days journey into night, which is a play I love, I could totally see him doing that. It's, a sh- uh, I love the film version the Sydney Lumet one. I, I know it's been done uh, a few times. It's too bad that it was never filmed. Um, it seems yeah. as if that was more favorable. Cheney said he was quite good in that as well. Yeah, that was that was definitely a, a, a high point of his career. And he was really hailed for that performance um, by the critics. Uh, you know, so that was definitely one of the pinnacles of his, I guess, the pinnacle of his career on stage, certainly. Um, uh, yeah, but I mean, that was a part that he was sort of born to play. He understood oh, yeah. it all being the sort of Irish patriarch. Um, yes. I think he really understood and, uh, you know, could put a lot of himself into. Yes, I would have, I would have loved, I would have loved to have seen him in, in that as the father. Uh, you know you can, um, I, I was never able to, one, one of my big regrets is when I was researching the books, I, I ran out of money and was not able to go to New York because Apparently, the New York Public Library um, has a large uh, video archive of live stage performances. I've heard that, yeah. Video of that play. Oh, wow. And it's a single stationary camera. So, you know, I mean, you'd have to sit down and watch it all. Yeah. Angle like you would if you were sitting in a a seat. But apparently there is video of it. But it's, again, never been commercially released. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, that's good to know. If I, Next time I'm there, I'm going to definitely check that out because I'd, yeah, I'd love to I, see it. That was a big regret of mine that I could not get there because they've got a great collection and um, I'm sure it would have helped in terms of like writing about his, his mm-hmm. theme more if I could have done that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll have to uh, I'll have to check that out one day. Um, well, Jim, thanks so much for coming on. I, I really appreciate that that you took the time uh, to do this, to talk about the book. And of course, uh, one of his uh, one of his great performances in film. So where where's the best place for is it for people to get the book? Is it pretty much available on anywhere books are sold? It's, or it's still it's well I don't know if it's available where books are sold. There aren't that many of those places left. <laughs> online that is. <laughs> it's online. Yeah, you can get it pretty much everywhere. I mean, it's um that's the nice thing about doing a book for a university press is they'll keep it in print forever. Um, it'll be around after I'm gone, and that's that's what every writer wants. So. Um, yeah, so you should be able to find it online if you're you're curious. Please read it. And, and thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your, appreciate your 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 interest in something that was published quite a while ago. And I am I'm very I'm very uh, very pleased to get this much attention for it so long after the fact. No, my pleasure. My pleasure. It's a it's a great great book. Is there anything? Is there any other books that you're working you're working on that you could talk about or? Um... I've, I've learned not to talk about what you're working on because a lot of times it <laughs> doesn't pan out. Right, right. And you have to go, people <laughs> ask, oh, what about, uh, it didn't really work out. Right, I see. Yeah. I, I made the mistake. I, the first book I, book I was working on that I tried to write, I told everybody about it and then it wound up, you know, tanking. And uh, with this one, I didn't really say anything until I had a contract in hand and that was the way to do it. So good. Yes, that's, <laughs> I don't blame you because I know, uh, as an actor myself, that happens. Things get canceled, funding falls through, and then you got to disappoint everyone. <laughs> right. So I try, I try to, it's always best to keep your mouth shut until you know it's really going to go. go right. Out. Right. Well, thanks again, uh, Jim, and, and please come again sometime. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to the link patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. Patreon is bonus content that I create month in and month out. It is based on polls that I create, which you will be able to vote on, which means that you will be very much a part of the decision making as to what kind of content I create on Patreon month in and month out. Patreon is a great way for content creators and other artists such as myself to create an income from Patreon. So that will give me more flexibility to do even more videos, which of course on YouTube are absolutely free to listen to as well as the audio version of my podcast. So if you're interested in supporting my work, head over to patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo for full details. 
And if you are currently listening to this on the audio version of my podcast and you've run out of episodes to listen to because there's only so many episodes on the audio version, head over to the YouTube channel where every single episode that I've ever recorded can be found. YouTube.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. And lastly, if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to my channel by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left in just a second. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new videos or when I go live. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.